go. Whew. And and Pete, do you mind turning on the transcript? Because I'm not going to puzzle it through right this second. I uh, will go for it. Good. And my laptop has just decided to join the world. So hold on a second. Good. Um, <sighs> all right. Um, that's great. We had a lovely um, call last week. There's um, all sorts of things that, that occurred in my head since, and I was interested in what else had occurred in your head. So I thought we would do a debrief uh, of that right now. Um, and just for the record, this is the OGM weekly call for Thursday, November 16th, 2023. And uh, I thought I would just open the space and see uh, first, like, just emotions, whatever, what, um, how have you all, what has happened for you since uh, that call? Any, any insights, any comments, any thoughts or any emotional reactions? Go ahead, Gil. So I wouldn't call the call, I wouldn't describe the call as lovely. I would describe it as good and rich and uh, very appreciated. Um, it's hard to use lovely in these days. <clears throat> um, um, stuff isn't happening in my head, it's happening in my body and my being and, uh, and, and, and my moods. Um, um, the PTSD has calmed down some, the grief is ever present. Um, my impatience has grown. Um, I actually blocked somebody yesterday. I blocked a friend yesterday. It's the first time I blocked a friend. Uh, block, I blocked I think three strangers in my however many 15 years on social media, uh, two of them in the last month. Um, and that's reflecting an impatience with, um, in contrast to what we did here uh, with the oversimplification that so many people seem to be thrown to. I uh, had one person who said online, well, it's really plain and simple, da, 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 da. I thought, well, fuck, man, it's not plain and simple. You're plain and simple if you can say it's plain and simple. Uh, and so I'm really struck by um, the challenge that so many people have of holding complexity. Um, I'm um, shutting off any images of destruction that are always posted of like one side suffering or the others. I'll, you know, I'll grip my teeth and tolerate something that shows both sides suffering, but I will not look at the violence porn of one side or the other. Um, and um, yeah, and the person I blocked yesterday um, it was partly for all the reasons I said, but the a series of posts that just felt to me downright cruel um, in their political posturing, uh, cruel and heartless. And I won't tolerate that from, I've seen that from both sides. And I want more from the so-called pro-Palestinian side, um, but from the Israeli side too. And I won't tolerate that. So I, a long way of saying, I appreciate the care and reflectiveness um, that we've had in this conversation here. And I've tried to nurture that elsewhere, but I'm discovering that I need to just kind of step back from, from being in social media conversations about this stuff and focus on my own stuff for a while. Well, thank you and, and well put, and thanks for correcting my use of the word lovely, which seemed awkward when I said it, but I was trying to figure out how to explain what kind of a call we'd had. So yeah. that's really it was helpful. It was, it was a good thing. Good and hard. Yeah. Um, good, and hard good and hard and tender. Yeah. yeah. Oh. <laughs> I was just touching my, I'm, I'm on my laptop now, as you can probably tell, but um, I went to touch the screen on my on my Mac and that doesn't work because it turns out that uh, the interface is different. <clears throat> um, anyone else with, uh, with reflections? I really uh, liked the 
the uh, video you posted yesterday, Gil, on on from uh, Elon Musk. Mm. I thought he was really spot on uh, in in describing this from a uh, from an unbiased uh, observer perspective. Um, Surprisingly so, yeah. And uh, I mean, I must say, my my biggest takeaway from the discussion was Simon talking about the messianic influences on both on 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 uh, that are driving you know these these uh, passions. Because then you have to think that these uh, passions are also prevalent uh, here in the United States. Because, um, <clears throat> and what what really hit me is, I spent some you know, time in in the church uh, in the nineties mostly, and at that time, the most popular reading in the Christian community was um, "Left Behind." I don't know if you've heard of of this series, right? That's pretty scary stuff because um, that's celebrating the idea of the rupture and uh, leaving this earth to join, you know, a better life <laughs> in a different place. And so when you when you think that there's a significant share of the U.S. population that is really believing this, I mean, really fervently believing that the end times may have arrived and. Uh, and they start in the Holy Land, and it will be all good because you now the, you no, know, and, and so so that's real. This is not. This is you know we we are looking at this as thinking uh, of it in abstract terms, but you know that's a that's a that's a true belief, and so to 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 reach out you know, and and find uh, uh, in in. You know, find ways to pull people out of this mindset and this worldview, I think is a real challenge for us now. Uh, Pete, then Gil. Uh, thanks. Uh, and thanks for setting up the call, Jerry. Um, uh, it was it was rich and I really appreciated it. Um, on reflection, um, I, I won't talk about the subject too much, more about about the call, rather. Um, on reflection, uh, I was really touched by uh, Shimon's um, uh, discussion. Um, and it made me feel a lot, I, I, I left the call feeling a lot more hopeful and less stressed than, uh, than, than I thought I would, would have. And that I thought I would about the topic at all, actually. So I I really appreciate the call. Um, uh, as you might know, I I also set up a transcript and a GPT for the call afterwards. And in doing that, um, looking over the call and playing with the the chat with the call a little bit, um, I was struck by something. I was st struck by something which I thought was really interesting. There were a bunch of things that kind of hit for me during the call that I noticed and made a no mental note to myself. You should go back and, and listen to this call again because there's, you know, there are, there's um, interesting prospects for peace. Um, uh, it's going to be take a lot longer than we thought it would. Um, uh, there are concrete next steps to do bunch of kinds of things that came up for me in the call that the the best I could do during the call um, I it like it wouldn't have made sense to take notes or anything I, I took mental notes I guess but it was like watch out for these things the next time you you watch the call mm -hmm. um, and I ended up not watching the call um, because uh I, I hate to say it, and this may, might sound stupid or something, but um, having uh, ChatGPT process the call for me in a couple different ways was enough for me to get the high points that I had remembered to flag for a next watching. And I got them better and quicker and richer and deeper and more of them. There were, um, you know, the, I, I would have caught like four things about the call. Um, uh, on a rewatching, 
uh, with with a little just a little bit of discussion with ChatGPT, I got eight things. You know, um, I thought that was really interesting, and and um, it <clears throat> makes me sad that I don't have a ton of time to rewatch um, all the really good calls in the world. And it also makes me a little bit hopeful that we have tools um, to uh, help us see more of the world uh, faster because there's so much more to see. So not, not so much about the, the topic. Um, I, I wouldn't want to get into that, but um, I, it was interesting uh, digesting the call that way. And, and I appreciate, again, having a call where we're on one topic for the whole time and um, we're able to get 90 minutes or 13,000 words of kind of rich material um, on, on one particular topic. I really like that. And Pete, thank you for the post-processing you did of the call. That was terrific. That was really, um, really helpful. And you're reminding me now to go back and, and do more with it, uh, which is one of the things I wanted to ask about uh, as a part of the After Action Review. Um, so thank you for that. Um, Hank? And uh, hold on a second, Hank. Uh, Gil, I think you had your hand up or someone I, had I did. Up. I did in Zoom took it down. So just very briefly to Klaus. Yeah, uh, if I could, Hank, thank you. Uh, to Klaus's point about the messianics, um, um, you know, I, my interpretation is that one of the reasons this thing is so complicated is that uh, both sides are in the grips of their crazies right now. Um, and um, um, the messianics are different in the different Abrahamic traditions. I mean, the Christian messianics are happy for Israel to get blown to shit because that arch is in the next age and the Muslims have a notion of death being an honorable way to live your life, and the Jews have their own different craziness. And um, great resource on this is Karen Armstrong's book, The, the, the Battle for God, um, about the uh, fundamentalists, extremists of all three. Um, but in, in the aftermath of last week's conversation, I found myself wondering, who are the Israeli settlers in the West Bank, who, in case you don't know, are um, not only you know, not only exacerbating the, the, the battle over land, but the violence in the West Bank against Arabs has grown, grown enormously in the last month. Um, uh, and we can go into that another time. It's horrific, I think. Um, but I found myself wondering what percentage of those people are American immigrants to Israel? Turns out it's about 15%. Israeli population overall, it's about 2%. So, um, and these are not Christian millennial fundamentalists, these are Orthodox Jewish fundamentalists, um, um, but they're also coming out of the cowboy myth. They're carrying the American Wild West cowboy myth with them into the West Bank. And uh, anyhow, so I was, I've been worried about that and I'm, <laughs> I'm even more worried knowing the number. Um, thanks, Gil. So uh, the most video if people hadn't seen it, he said, um, the, uh, Lex Friedman said, so what do you recommend? He said, gratuitous, he said for the Israelis to, to flood the zone with gratuitous acts of compassion. My brother-in-law used to talk about his strategy for Israeli-Palestine issue would be to, would be to um, fly planes over and grab chickens, drop, just drop lots of food. So outside the box, kids. Thanks. Thanks, Gil. Uh, Hank, please go ahead. Thanks. Um, as uh, any of you uh, heard uh, last week when I was on the call, I found it a very uh, emotional. Uh, I th what's happening there, I'm taking in a very emotional way, and I was rather emotional on the call. And I was uh, very, very happy that uh, most of, of you and most of the people on the line were able to lift it up out of the, the emotional sea of, uh, of suffering that's happening and really talk in way, systemic ways and, and other ways about uh, uh, what might be done to... Uh, uh, to stop the war that's going on there. And uh, right after 
the call, I was feeling better because I realized that you can apply systems, thinking concepts and others like that, complexity concepts to uh, looking at a world situation like that. And by chance that evening, I went to a lecture by uh, the daughter of Archbishop uh, Desmond Tutu, Mafo Tutu, who lives in the Netherlands and was lecturing about uh, a book she wrote with her father uh, some years ago called The Book of Forgiving, The Fourfold Path for Healing Ourselves and the World. And that's a message that I think could have been expressed better in uh, the call. And if we would look into that type of message, we could see that what happened in the uh, awful and somewhat analogous situation in South Africa with the Truth and Reconciliation Committee shows that it is possible for human beings who look at each other hatefully through the barrel of a gun to tell their story, name their hurt, grant each other forgiveness, and then renew a relationship, as the Tutu elder and, and daughter call their fourfold ways. And uh, a day after that, I went to hear uh, Kim Stanley Robinson, who was in Amsterdam, speaking about ministry for the future. And uh, in a totally different way, it gives me lots of hope that people can decide that something has to be done and in very, very many ways attempt to understand different things that have to be done. And I'm not sure how that is in, in America, but in all uh, climate uh, demonstrations in the Netherlands and a lot of them in Europe, climate and social justice and uh, the war between Israel and Palestine are all intertwined. So uh, between uh, Mrs. Tutu and Stan Robinson, I think there's a lot to be thought about and a lot to be learned. And the last uh, <clears throat> question on your after action review list, uh, Jerry, is uh, where we might take this topic. And I'm going to take it on a sidestep and say, I think it'd be wonderful if uh, OGM and calls like this would address real life uh, issues in this type of emotional, but also uh, uh, cognitive science way. So I'll leave my comments at that. Thank, thank you. And I'm I'm heading toward that question as well. Do you want to say a little bit more about that? I, I, are you saying let's do more of what we did? Or are you saying something different? Or am I misunderstanding you? You know, I'm, I'm saying I thought it was wonderful to take such a, a situation as Israel, uh, Palestine, and Gaza and address it in the way we did. And it would be useful to take it further if there's enough interest for people on the call, but also to take other major challenges of the world. I think, as you were saying, Peter, one call for one issue, or maybe two calls for one issue, and apply our different perspectives on the world to making sense of sometimes uh, senseless situations. Thank you, Hank. Um, so I'd love to do that. Uh, Eric, then Pete. Yeah, hi, everybody. So um, I wasn't on the call, but I watched it uh, last Saturday. And it's an emotional thing to hear everybody's different opinions. And uh, I could understand all of you. Um, as a Jew, um, it is a really tough thing. I'm sort of like weighing both sides. It's hard for me to express a, a concrete opinion. But um, 
I need to look at it practically what in my life makes sense. So I donated to several charities that I believe in, and I posted information about Seeds of Peace. And uh, I asked a question, and it's in the chat as well. So um, personally, um, like this Sunday, I'm going to be uh, teaching a music class to Hebrew school children. And this hits home, like, how do children understand what's happening in the world? Do they even, are they even told about it by their parents at certain ages? What's the right age for a child to know about war? So in the music, I have Israeli dancing, Israeli singing, and pictures of Israel when I was there in 1989. And uh, that will be like a half hour thing it, there's something else going on the rabbi's doing as well but uh it really is tough for jews right now um all over seeing the depth of the anti-semitism that's coming out there and the the guy who was killed and the students who are locked in a library so um you know like what message do we tell our children that well, this is the world we're living in now, and you do have to be careful. We're, as parents and teachers, we're here to protect you as best we can, but you have to learn to hide certain parts of yourself, it seems. <laughs> and um, then in December, I'll be doing a, a talking about Flori Jagoda, who wrote a Hanukkah song, famous one called Ocho Kandalikas, and she grew up in Bosnia, uh, Sarajevo, and uh, had an amazing uh, story. She had a great childhood, but then she had to get on a train by herself with nothing else, just her accordion, and travel to Split, another town in Croatia, and wait for her parents there. And uh, she finally got reunited with her parents, but you can imagine that agony for a 15-year-old to have to take on the world and suddenly just drop everything of your life. So um, I understand how powerful forgiveness is, but practically I don't see that happening with the political structures in place. Uh, this is gonna play itself out somehow and it's scary. Um, we just have to uh, really look at our local communities, make sure we're safe where we are. Thank you. Thanks, Eric. Um, Peter, next, and please take your time stepping in. Thanks. I, I, I will pause for a few seconds to let Eric's Thanks for bringing that um, to the room, Eric. I appreciate it. Um, and it it actually, um, not that it needs to do anything except be heard. Thank you again, Eric. Um, it, it helps illustrate something that I wanted to say. Um, Hank kind of reinforced the idea of the, the one topic call. And I, I think it's really powerful and really good. Um, uh, I wanted to note um, one of the things that that made it a good call, a rich call, was the um, uh, was hearing from from um, thoughtful, um, passionate people uh, who had skin in the game. Uh, so Shimon, um, for instance, or Klaus with his daughter, for instance. Uh, Eric just now. Um, I I think part of the part of the format of those kind of deep calls on complex subjects, uh, you know, complex, large geopolitical sized subjects, um, need to have a, a fair amount of grounding in lived lives and lived experiences um, from people who are actually you know, in, entangled in the situation. 
Um, I think that that is what makes it a, a good call. Um, so then also, um, part of the reason I did what I did, I, I didn't do a lot of work processing the call, but I did some. Um, and a big part of the reason I did that was to help others um, spread the, help, help others distribute the, the message messages in the call. Um, and kind of the meta messages too. Um, I Hank kind of said this, but maybe I'll try saying it a different way. Um, one of the things, one of the things I got from that call was not just a little bit, a tiny bit of of a better understanding or or a less unsettled feel about the situation. Not that I'm settled about it at all, <laughs> but one of the things I got out of the call was somebody like Shimon or somebody like Klaus not freaking out in a situation that could be really freaky, really, really uh, hard to deal with. Um, so a meta message from the call was, you know, we, we get through these things. As Hank said, uh, you can actually, you know, bring some of your tools like systems thinking uh, into a situation where, you know, before it, it just felt like, oh my gosh, there's so much going on and it's so scary and it's so confusing and I don't know which side and my hair is on fire. You can actually bring that down and partly because you have to, um, Shimon or, or Klaus or Eric have to live in the world with a, a terrible situation. You just figure out how to, to deal with it and you start working through things and you start looking for um, looking for the light, looking for people uh, who want to help and, you know, start moving forward. So I, I really appreciate that about the call too, that it was um, a meta, you know, a, a meta message of hope and, and moving forward. Thanks. Pete, hey, thank you. You're, you move directly to the second question, which is what worked well in the call. The third question I'll remind everybody that I posed is what didn't work. And I'd love to get there as well. But you did. You just very nicely explained a bunch of things that that I hadn't crystallized myself about what was working well. So thank you for that. Anybody else? Uh, what just what worked well? Uh, I think th there was a sense of a fortunate serendipity in some sense because I got a message the night before from Shimon saying, "Oh my gosh, this topic is great. I need to clear my calendar a little bit. I'll be on the call. I, I think I can be on the call. I wasn't even sure he was going to make it." And I'd forgotten his many links into the topic. Um, and so the fact that Shimon is a member of our community and saw, you know, saw the invite was a piece of fortune for all of us, I think, uh, in that in that sense. Um, so there's a and another thing that Stacy pointed out, which provoked the call, was that the tone and tenor and manner of our conversations enabled us to step into the topic in a way and with a history and with a trust in each other that I think was useful and uh, helped make the call better than it otherwise might have been. Um, anybody else with things that worked well? Okay, then, what didn't work? So it was a perfect call. This is like Trump's perfect call with Rappensburger. <laughs> I mean, it could not have gone better. <clears throat> um, Hank, go ahead. It's it's a combination of uh, what went well and what you could do better. Uh, I think 90 minutes was really the upper limit going into a topic like that. And what we could do better, well, that's the, the one topic uh, one, two or three calls idea, which seems to be appreciated by a number of people here. So I, usually I would say in a different circumstance, oh yeah, well, if you can talk for 90 minutes, you can talk for 120 minutes or even longer. But I, I was happy that it was only 90 minutes. I, I tend to favor 90 minutes often for conversation like that or conversation that matters to me, partly because at the hour, 
very often at 50 minutes is when we've just gotten cranking and things are sort of warming up and we're figuring out where we are and what's going on. And so having one hour slots, it's like therapy is 50 minutes long. And I'm like, that's just such a shitty time frame. Because uh, for some people, you just start sinking into things at 50. Uh, and it's like, ah, oh, sorry, time's up, got to go. Um, and and so, and then I think there's a, there's a kind of emotional exhaustion that sets in if you've been at it and, and really in for 90 minutes where you either need a break and then re reconvene or, you know, do it next time. So I, I really like the 90 minute format and two hours seems long. And when I hit podcasts that are three hours long, I don't listen to most of them. Um, I can't sit for three hours uh, listening to something unless somebody guides me to exactly what what mattered for me or something like that. It's hard. Um, but thank you. Uh, and in the interest of what didn't work well uh, or what could be made better, um, I'm always interested in how we note take about what we learn from the calls. And so I'm extra grateful for the post-processing Pete did. Uh, and also uh, want to go back into this and see how we could together uh, in different ways curate resources out of what we're talking about that might be useful to other humans. Uh, that always being the the purpose for such curation for me anyway. Uh, Gil. So you're muted. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, thanks, Jerry. Uh, um, Yes, on 90 minutes for all the reasons that you said. Um, I I don't comprehend three-hour podcasts. Um, neither the people who make them nor the people who listen to them. I can't, I don't understand how people have time in their lives to listen to three-hour podcasts. And for the people who say, well, I do it while I'm doing other things, I think, gosh, wouldn't it be nice to just kind of be doing other things and have your own thoughts instead of just the constant. This is the Ken's FOMO Jomo thing, maybe. Um, um I, I haven't looked at Pete's uh, custom GPT on this. I'm intrigued by that. And I like the combination of Hank and Pete's suggestion. Let's let's do, um, I think not two, maybe three or four sessions on topics of this complexity uh, and have the GPT processing in between and attention for all of us to look at that or interact with that some kind of way and maybe bring in the GPT into the conversation that we're having live. Um, Ken and I are probably going to experiment next month. We, we've um, we've been training four years of living between worlds conversations on a custom, not 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 a GPT, but a, a, something else someone's building for me. Uh, and I've been interrogating that. And we're thinking about um, Ken. We haven't. I don't know if we've talked about this much, or this is totally new to you. <laughs> so I'm thinking about. Um, bringing the bringing the bot into the conversation with our forty people on the call, putting it up on screen and inviting people to poke it and ask it questions and see what it generates, and then discussing that live in the interaction. So there may there's there's something interesting to play with about uh, the call. Well, I think we're set at ninety. How many to do in a sequence of a topic and how to play with the with the with the GPT um, as a not an artificial intelligence but as an augmented intelligence for us in our conversation. Thanks, Gil. Um, Judy and Pete, and take your time stepping in. Just wanted to make sure I wasn't muted. <clears throat> um, I, what I find highly valuable in these conversations is the richness and diversity of the knowledge of the participants and their ability to bring in not only talking points, but references for deeper dives as well. And I like that that exists in the OGM <clears throat> chat cycle that we use <clears throat> because it allows me to take in contrarian opinions, synthesize, I mean, it just allows a much deeper level of pursuit of understanding, which then leads to internal pursuit of self-awareness or self positioning and that's really what keeps me coming back to this community at the same time having said that i appreciate some of the less formal conversations as well because i think it lets us connect as people without the mantle of the weight of some of the topics that we choose to discuss thank you Oops. 
Thanks. Um, quick comment uh, for Gil. Um, I, I really like the idea of bringing, well, actually I, I do and I don't, I have to say. Um, I really I like the idea of bringing in um, a GPT into, the, into a conversation. Um, the, um, uh, having, having worked with uh, the, the bots for a while, um, the, the, the advice I would have maybe is, uh, is not to treat it as a participant and not to treat it as a, a person. Um, and um, even though I, I break that rule a lot, um, I'll, I'll say, you know, the bot understands or the bot thinks or the bot knows, you know, something. All of those words are actually for humans. They're not really for bots. Um, but on the other hand, we don't have a word for the thing that uh, a bot does when it's acting very much like it understands something or acts like it knows something. So you kind of get stuck. But but anyway, I there's a the I <clears throat> I use um, I use a chat bot a lot and I use an art bot a lot, um, both. And the thing that I grew into, and I think this is true for, for everybody, um, is it, it helps you do things um, and you don't want to let it have the, the say on what something means. What something means is for people. Um, there's a great quote that, that Bill shared from Emily Bender. Um, I'll look it up, but, um, people make the meaning of what a bot says. The, the, the bot says things that sounds like it has meaning, but it doesn't. Um, so in a conversation with a group, um, the thing that I would be interested in as somebody who's used bots a lot is, yeah, okay. So the bot, um, um, regurgitated and put together a, a really interesting couple of thoughts there and it does those they do it all the time um putting together you know things out of things that humans have said but i don't really care what it says i care what the person who's asked the bot the question sa thinks about that okay so you know the bot said blah 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 um, I think it's right in these ways, maybe wrong in these ways. And that makes me think of other things, right? I'm really interested in the human reaction to what a bot says. I'm not so interested in what a bot says. Thanks. Thanks, Pete. And I, I think it's um, um, fun and exciting that we're asking questions and able to have resources and tools that let us ask questions like you just asked and to ponder about how do these new intelligences play in our conversations, et cetera, et cetera. That's like, who thought, I didn't think I'd be writing down the numbers 2023 on checks and papers like that. That seems like a distant number. <clears throat> and, the, and the thing you just said, I'm like, well, there we are. We're in a little magic wonderland of, of strange things. Uh, so thanks for the, those reflections. Uh, Klaus, then Doug, please. Yeah, I, I agree that, uh um the the bot is really um very much reflecting on your thought process uh, and and uh, um if you have set it up to stay within boundaries of 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 how you want to frame your thought process then you get some you know pretty uh, amazing and pretty fast uh, uh responses i mean i did uh, I did scan the, um, the the bot asked me to scan in the neo book, fifty seven pages in order to write a review, and it was very offensive because it took exactly one second for it to read these fifty seven pages. Then you know it's gone, and then it comes back with you know, uh, uh, what looked like a really professional book review, you know? but. Um, it really is a reflection of your own thought process you know, because you have to sort of tell it where you want to go. Um, what, one thing that I really got out of this conversation or that really disturbed me in, in this conversation last week is the, the uh, uh, broader context. You know, first of all, 
that these conflicts are happening all over the globe right now, and that there is um, that there is a clear you know, uh, run towards authoritarianism, towards theocracy, towards monocultures, and so on. And so, what what uh, uh, came to me was this: uh, uh, the culture in crisis from Sorokin. Um, so I pulled up his book and, and ran it through the AI. Um, in, in fact, I, I, I sent something out yesterday about it. But um, the 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 and the reason I I I, I fell back on Sorokin is that he really almost perfectly defines this the the time we are in this turmoil this period of transition. And the, the the pressures this brings. Um, so I mean, he he you know his theory really is that in this time of uh, transition, you know, we we experience um, uh, an attempt by the existing structures to maintain control, you know, to maintain um, instead of recognizing where to shift to. They want to stay in place and double down on it, and it's creating enormous tensions. And and but in order to step back and really recognize, like what theory, what Otto Sharma is calling, allowing the future, you know, uh, to unfold and stepping into the future, that process is very difficult to to do. And um, I mean, coming back at uh, all the information that we have now. Uh, from science is that we are in in some um, in a very precarious uh, situation with the environment running away much faster than anyone expected, uh, and uh, the the conflicts that we are having is uh, something we can't we absolutely cannot afford you know, um, because it is global and they, you know and and these these conflicts add so first of all they waste resources that could be otherwise dedicated you know, towards building technology and tools that and processes that we need to catch this uh, and then on top of it uh, you know, create more destruction and, and more pollution so I, I think AI is going to be a real um, a, 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 an amazing tool you know, it's fascinating uh, and, and uh, the most uh, astonishing thing is how fast we have gotten used to using it uh, and and just just uh, working with it um, but I think we we really need to uh, um, I, I mean chat GBT wouldn't have thought of using Sorokin and this paper on its own right so you it's not like you can ask it a question and get magic answers now you can really only use your own thought process, but then then have the AI take a deep dive on this that would that moves you way beyond where you would have landed. Yeah. So so it's it's uh, I don't know how to describe it a helper or whatever, but uh, it's a it's an amazing research assistant, uh, and and in some ways it mentors you right because it brings out issues. That way beyond what your horizon uh, uh, was at the time. Um, thanks, Klaus. I'll I'll note that we're sort of having the meta longer discussion a little bit now in our comments, um, and I I would I do want to cue a little bit to the after action review, and then and then sort of let us <clears throat> back into the topic. I think, um, Doug, what's it like living with Family Guy? Um, lighter. <laughs> Love that. Just in in the times we're in, and it's yeah. just like, yeah, just um, Isn't it the Simpsons living room. Um, I I'm I'm not sure actually which it attributes to. It's the one that vibrationally is the the lightest and sort of most joy provoking. Um, I I. Where Klaus just left off is sort of where I'd like to pick up, but through a different lens and, and really referencing back to the after action of like what's right. And <clears throat> stepping out of the um, bringing the rearview mirror in 
terms of all that's new, all that we can do, all that's happening then, <laughs> and stepping out of projecting into a future um, that doesn't exist yet. In the in the the present moment, in the space that OGN represents and is co-created by the people that assemble it. Um, there's a spaciousness and there is a balance. And Eric can share his emotional reality. And Shimon, what was most shocking to me in, in, a, in Shimon's sharing was the lack of his, you know, being emotionally engulfed the degree to which he was just in the moment and in response to in as active a way it was, as it was possible to be in the belly of the beast in as many directions as possible. And that this space is safe enough so that, um, you know, people's feelings can be expressed and this space is safe enough that um, people's fire can be expressed. And this space is um, welcoming and open to people's capacity to wrestle with really complex things and um, attempt and endeavor to make sense. Um, and underlying all of that is a groundedness, I think, in a common the value that's rooted in Thanks, Doug. Um, let's talk, um, uh, let's bounce to the next question, which is how might we improve such a call uh, for a little bit? I'll, uh, Judy, I'll go to you in a, in a sec, but then I'd like to shift to this, which is, um, we're talking about maybe doing a series of three or four calls. I'd like to actually sort of nail that down so that we can figure out what we mean and I can plan for it uh, in the call sequence. Uh, but go ahead, Judy. I was just going to comment that over the years, this group has evolved into one which has a high level of trust in the values and frameworks of the people in the group, which then allows really deep conversations and a trusting of the additional resources that are brought into the group by other members of the group. So I think that, that what we do online is really important because that trust is built in the human contact. But I think that how we assemble the aggregated knowledge afterwards is another important dimension worthy of some further conversation that's frankly beyond my scope from a technology standpoint, but those of you that are better at it <clears throat> might have some thoughts about how to make the shared wisdom more available to people we trust um, to invoke deeper conversations in other settings. I'm reflecting here on our group and our call and some of the things we're talking about and realizing that I don't want to over praise us for what we did in part because I don't know that we have any representatives or anybody who feels strongly at the very opposite end of the spectrum who is in the room. Um, and I think our dynamic might have been different had there been, or if there were in our community, somebody like that. So I think we did a, uh, we had a, we did well with being, I think, within a range of reactions or emotions about the topic that were bounded in some sense that weren't um, as broad as they otherwise might be. And I don't know what might have happened uh, had a few participants uh, been in the room, even if they'd been in our community for a long time, with stronger feelings about um, the Palestinian side of things or, or whatever. I don't, I don't know, but we didn't have that. So I feel like we did well for who we are and what we do, um, but I don't want to over over overreach on that or overstate it. Uh, so I'm tempted, um, go ahead, Gil, I'll come back to what I'm about to say. 
just just briefly um i know for me and i suspect for others that we um I don't know what the word is, Jerry. We sort of curated ourselves in this conversation. Mm -hmm. It wasn't just open your mouth to speak. I was reflective before I spoke. Um, careful in how I spoke, not in the sense of self-censorship, but just be careful uh, in the context of what we have built here together. Um, and so that, as I say that, I just think that that may be something worth some observation in another time about what what of the relationships, the process, the history, the way we've talked together has given us the ability to shape a conversation with care like we had last time. Um, and I think your, your your other point, if there were more, if there was more diversity of views in the room, that might be challenging or that might be just absolutely what this needs to try to do that in this kind of frame, which harkens back to truth and reconciliation and other things that we've talked about. So right. thank you. Thank you very much. That's um, that's really helpful. Um, so I'm I kind of borrowed this. Normally, we've been alternating a while ago. I'd have forgotten exactly when, but I could find out. <clears throat> we decided to alternate formats between check ins and topics. And I borrowed this call, which would normally have been a check in because I was really interested in processing how last week's call went. Uh, so we're doing a bit of an action after action review, but I'm getting the sense that we might um, actually want to sit down and do a three or four week uh, run with no check-ins in between on maybe this topic, maybe this topic reframed or a slightly broader topic, I don't know, uh, but something like that. And I'd love, I'd love to get the sense of the room and figure that out so that we can kind of map it and then plan for it as we step through the calls and see if we want to wait or shift the calls uh, in some way that might be useful to us. I'd like to experiment with the, 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 the group that we have, the, the souls and minds that we have present and see how, uh, how to tackle this. So the floor is open, so to speak, to uh, format suggestions, process suggestions, uh, experiment suggestions, uh, whatever else you'd like. Go ahead, Pete. Um, with, without derailing that request, I, I think that's a brilliant and thoughtful and useful request. Um, I think another, another step is to understand why we're having these calls. So what's the charter of this call series? Um, what, what do we expect to get out of it? What, how will we share it with the world if, if we share it with the world? Um, how will we think? How do we think the world will change uh, if we're successful with our calls? Um, I would really like to understand that, and that would help ground the rest of it. You know, the calls. How do we set up the calls? What the topics are? Um, who's involved? What we do at the the artifacts afterwards? Do you want to take a first swing? Uh, nope. <laughs> ah, damn it! Contribute. <clears throat> Can um, I talk to them? Please. Just for like thirty seconds. Okay. Uh, Jesse, I think that there we go. That, I, I, thought, I thought you were talking to us, but you weren't. <laughs> sorry, I wasn't. <laughs> That's all right. Thank you. Um, Kevin, then Judy. <clears throat> um, Eleanor Ostrom says that a group of ranchers can manage a watershed about, I think it's 47% higher than the government can if certain conditions apply. And one of them is frequent, kind of unplanned or casual interaction with each other. Like they meet at the post office, they meet at a particular store, and then they <clears throat> they have good agreements about the watershed that are transparent of what happens upstream and downstream. But I think the, the check-ins are really good for that level of, call this watershed management. You know, the check-ins is who you are and what you're doing. And that's a key thing to cause things to flow well. And if you don't have those, the watershed is not nearly as well managed. If you just meet at the meetings, then you don't get to know the folks and you don't have folks in other contexts. So I think it's a, it's useful for whatever we do to keep that kind of thing happening. Thank you for making that explicit. I hadn't sort of realized that or thought of it. And I, a year ago, I was getting more involved in the HOA in our building. And I, mm. realized, I realized that HOA guidelines or laws mean that Members of the HOA who are on the board cannot 
talk to each other unless there are three or more of them present or some stupid thing like that. Wow. Wow. Like, like they are restricted because it, otherwise it's considered a meeting or collusion or God knows what. And I was like, oh my God. So joining the board basically screws up your ability to sit and hang and chew the fat and figure out what's going on and who thinks what. That is just ludicrous. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> it's back, systemically going to be less efficient. Back to reality. Um, <clears throat> it was an anti-corrupt. It was an anti-corruption move some years ago. Okay, it's 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 common in government in, in legislative bodies. Yep, yep. But but what a damaging thing to the kinds of informal discourse we need. I, I understand the safeguards. So one of my one of my little tropes is that we we pass we pass laws when discourse fails. Mm -hmm. That I would rather have way fewer laws and have people able to sort of do discourse. One of the, one of the really bitter lessons of Trump's victory in 2016 and then he, learning about his MO is that one of the things he loves to do, one of his favorite tools in his playbook, is uh, to break norms. And the problem is that norms are not laws. And you can break all the norms you want. What you get is other people being upset, but they can't put you in jail for breaking a norm. They can put you in jail for breaking a law, which 91 indictments are trying to do right now, really hard, and may fail. Don't know. But... But I would prefer to live in a society with way fewer hard rules and way more social interaction and norms. And like Oscar Wilde said, I'd love socialism, but I want my evenings. I'm misquoting him again. But, uh, you know, <clears throat> but all of that takes time and, and, and effort. Uh, Judy, please jump in. Oh, I was just thinking, and I keep following the current conversation, so then I forget what I was thinking when I raised my hand. But my recollection is that Part of what I've begun doing carefully is populating conversations with other groups of people with materials that have been ag aggregated by this group and just saying, just saw this really interesting thing. For instance, the one about the effect of colonialism on the current conflict between the Jews and the Palestinians and that sense of history. I'm not a historian, so I found that truly fascinating and have shared it with book clubs and other groups here just to get us thinking because we do talk about some of these topics but not in the same depth and so that's the the, the aggregation of the information that you provide jerry or the, that our chat stream and ogm provides when we're offline from one another and someone comes in and says based on what we talked about last week here's this cool article i saw I find very, very valuable. And it reinforces the sense of connection that I have with the people in the group. Thanks, Judy. One of the things I, I love, love, love about our conversations is that my little understanding, my amateur understanding of how the world works and what I care about and what's going on is always crystallized a little bit and improved and stitched together, woven together a little better uh, from these calls. And very often we'll wind up lost in the wilderness for the first 20 minutes of a call and then suddenly find our way into something that just makes sense and clicks in place. And I I, I live for those little aha moments of when a couple things click in place and you feel like you understand something a little better, even if you're just fooling yourself about understanding those things. It's a pleasant, it's a pleasant pastime and maybe productive. Um, I'm also very interested in more explicitly and more visibly and more publicly clicking those ideas together so that they can be held up, turned around, examined, experimented with, compared with other people's perceptions. This I think leaves you in me mechanisms for insightful learning. In Gil, I think that's your audio. Sorry. No worries. Um, so what... Um, what should we do about these calls? How should we structure this? What would you like to do? And we don't have to think really long-term, but what, what should we do for the next two, three, four, five, six calls, uh, given what we've learned and talked about here? What would you like to see happen? Hank. Uh, I, what I think would be worth doing is discovering both for individuals on the call and for the collectiveness on the call, if we address a topic for two, three, or four uh, conversations, does it really create new knowledge or new understanding? 
And I don't want to say that we should uh, try to uh, quantify it, but in a qualitative way, I think it'd be a terrific uh, experience to find out if a group of 10 or, or 15 or 20 people could actually uh, deepen and broaden their understanding of uh, the topic we're talking about. I love that. I, I found it interesting that Shimon had actually taken Kumu <clears throat> and drawn some diagrams of, and, and the diagrams that he had drawn were basically structural diagrams of how Israel uh, makes governmental policy decisions and the, the role, the interplay between religious bodies and government bodies and a bunch of that kind of thing. It was just the beginning of a Kumu, and, and I don't know that he's a Kumu black belt, but but sort of maybe curating and enhancing some of those things over time would be something we could do as well. Uh, and and <clears throat> I could ask Gene Bellinger or Christina Bowen, who are, are the, two, the two Kumu black belts I know of, if they've already seen uh, uh, system maps about the situation, or if they would be interested in helping Shimon improve his or whatever, because that, that would be one interesting side project that might uh, might help us describe or tackle these things. And I, I say that <clears throat> also knowing that a really well fleshed out system map in Kumu is often overwhelming to me, and I need it to be unfolded for me. And Bellinger is re really, Gene is really good at doing that. He'll say, here's the start, then you add this, then you add this, and all of a sudden you're looking at this system map, and now here's what happens when you tweak the variables. That, that, that's really interesting. And a second caveat to it, which is that sometimes systems maps barely describe the system and aren't necessarily that helpful in changing it. But I think they're helpful in making a few things explicit. So that would be an interesting side dish that, that I would love to to nurture along. Uh, Jesse. Uh, well, so last week's group time inspired me to write an article on compassion. And mindfulness and compassion is just rolling in my head every single day. Um, and I love the idea uh, if this group generates new understanding. And I know that after now, after you complete a Zoom call, you can have a little form, like a little survey that says whatever you want to put in there. Like, did you increase your level of understanding within the group's context of whatever? I mean, there's an opportunity to use that technology right after the Zoom call um, to start, I don't want to say measuring, but you know, if, you, if it was an experiment, to have that qualitative data for you to share with the group uh, in the next call, just to share. I think that would be kind of interesting. Um, I'm I'm not a huge Tim Ferriss fan <laughs> as, as, a <laughs> as a person, but, yeah. I re but I really admire this approach toward hacking things and trying to make your way through whatever, you know, just the, the quickest way through something. And I think that if we could maybe do a little bit of hacking of, of our of our approach and our thinking, it could be kind of useful. Um, so, so thank you. So, so if you would like to design a light pole, um, I don't use Zoom plus calendar in the way that the poll you just mentioned might require, because I think what you can do is after an event, you can send registered guests a poll, but nobody's registered for this call. I don't do that. I just have a link and everybody shows up for the link. But what I could do easily at the end of a call is I could just run the poll during the call because I tried a poll and it's not that hard to set up, but I don't know exactly which questions you think are, are interesting to um, uh, to put in. So if you'd like to do that, I'm happy to run a poll. Uh, yeah, you can actually make it so that you have the same question for all of your Zoom meetings throughout the week. And you don't even have to send it. It just you know shows up. But one question, maybe a qualitative, maybe quantitative, I don't know. But I think it's worth just exploring. Um, but at a later time, just wanted to say that technology exists. Cool. We could also wrap calls with one particular question and ask for feedback in the chat or uh, on the list or whatever else. Um, and if you want to help us formulate that question, that would be sure. like awesome. I'd love I'd, that. Yes. Thank you. Uh, and Mike is saying in the chat, asking, what is the one sentence that you'll most remember from the last 90 minutes could be interesting as well. Uh, Bill, then Pete. Uh, Bill, you took your hand down, but you didn't unmute. I know. 
Really, I want the I want the technology to be intelligent, not like yeah. you know, not this faux stuff. Faux. Oh. Um, <laughs> um. So there's several things. One, I think uh, Hank asked. You know, it's really an empirical question. So what Jesse just said is kind of interesting, and what Mike Nelson put in the chat is really kind of great. You know, so if we're going to ask an empirical question, we're going to like expect an answer somehow, some kind of answer. So we could do that for ourselves. Um, and so I think that would be really valuable. The other thing that's come up for me is uh, a couple of weeks ago, well, I don't know, I was in a conversation, I guess Jerry with you and Pete and some others, and Pete said, you know, his notion is a book is a place where knowledge goes to die. So I'm like, okay, uh, I don't think I'll, you know, toast to that word but nonetheless i'm getting the feeling that a lot of what we produce here even in the wonderful thing you know the follow-up that pete did is kind of you know uh, artifacts about what we've talked about what we've, what might be learned what and they go to places to die like i don't know a google email list which is like what is that talk about a heap on the floor that's you know so I would like for me, because things like for, for me, if, if they're thoughtful, well, I don't know, I'm older now. It takes me time. I, I like to think slowly. So then I would like to put a comment somewhere, but there is no, like, where would that go? And would it be available? And would it have any life that could be, you know, maintained that maybe it really requires for a group of people that want to actually preserve some of what they're discovering, thinking with each other, that we have to figure out and make some effort to have. And I don't know what it is in the world, an artifact, right? That can be, that we will, you know, commit to maintain in some way. And the other, the one thing I'll say, Jesse, about the poll, I think it'd be great on the other hand, I think most of the time I would just delete them because I don't, I hate that stuff. But I like Mike Nelson's question about here, take this question away with you. And, you know, if something comes up, you know, write it down or share it or, you know, whatever. So I think that's, um, that would be really valuable. Thanks, Bill. Um, Pete. Thanks. Um... And I kind of wanted to echo uh, how how Bill closed there. The, I, I love Jesse. Jesse, thanks for the idea. Um, I love the idea of using a Zoom poll uh, at the um, uh, at the end of a call. And um, I know for me at least, uh, I have no idea what happened on the call at the end of the call. Um, and if you ask me, <laughs> I you know, I'll give you an answer, but I won't, I won't like giving you an answer and I won't, it won't be a very intelligent answer. It won't be the answer that you, you wish. Um, so of course, um, as an, uh, you know, information management designer or a, a UX designer or something like that, I, and, and by extension, all of us, I, all of us know why the poll gets asked at the end of the Zoom call. It's because that's when everybody's still around and they haven't scattered to the wind. However, for me, that's like, probably the, the exact worst spot to ask the question. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll actually produce something interesting and probably I could train myself if I were asked every call. I could probably train myself to have an answer for the, the call. But where I wanted to go with this, I would be super sad if we asked something at the end of a call and we didn't ask it five days later. Because five days later, I can tell you what happened on the call, why I cared about it, what was interesting, what was important. Um, how I would do it again, how I wouldn't do it again, all that kind of stuff. Then you can ask me and I'll be able to tell you. Um, so, and of course, in U UX design land, the reason we don't do that is because we've scattered to the wind. Um, but uh, kind of to Bill's point, um, uh, it would be nice to be able to do that, to ask the question five days later, three, four, five, seven days later. Um, and it would be nice to figure out how we don't scatter to the wind to make that happen. Um, Jerry actually did it did it today. Um, he did a clever thing. He said, let's have an after, after action review of last week's call. So now we know a lot about last week's call, much more than we would have at the end of the call. Um, but 
obviously this is also, I think, unsustainable to have a call and then an after action review call um, seven days later, that doesn't work either. So it, there, it seems like there should be something in the middle. Um, I love the idea, Bill, of um, I have something to say about the call and I wanna say it. Uh, I know now the way it works, if we put it in uh, the mailing list, it will be lost to the sounds of times about 12 hours later. Um, and if we put it on Mattermost, um, I, I feel like nobody's going to find it there. Um, we don't have many people on the Mattermost who are also in the calls or on the mailing list. So we don't have that, you know, water cooler after, you know, after, after party discussion anywhere, I think. And I would love to have that. And I don't really know how to do it. Um, also, real quick, I wanted to mention... Um, uh, the thought that books are where knowledge goes to die. I, I remember having, um, it, it's kind of a, a telescoped and overamped way of saying something that I, I remember pretty distinctly having a similar thought uh, when I was doing a layover in Chicago or something like that in an airport. And I went into a really nice uh, airport bookstore. They have, you know, it was, it was a branch of a real bookstore. So they have a lot of books in it. Um, as well as magazines and candy and gum and stuff like that. And just walking through the books, you know, um, the, the thing that struck me was bookstores are where knowledge goes to die, where ideas go to die. Because um, uh, of all the books and ideas that get published and packaged up into books and offered for sale to people, the ones on the outside of the um, the outside of the store, the the trashy paper books and the flashy business, you know, um, uh, business management, you know, hotness and all that kind of stuff, next to the candy and the and the um, neck pillows and stuff like that. Those are the ones that get picked up and used. The rest of them feel a lot to me like a graveyard. Um, uh, a bookstore is a lot like a graveyard. Eighty percent, whatever, of those books, you know, get touched by very few people. Um, and especially now, uh, in the, in the olden days, maybe people, um, uh, people relied on books more because there weren't places that you would go and congregate and read and, and talk and stuff like that. Nowadays, we've, we've gone past that. Um, and so, um, the place where I read stuff is, God forbid, Twitter or Facebook, or uh, maybe a little bit better, Discord, or even better, Zoom calls. Um, I get a lot of information from my Zoom calls, probably much more than I read. Um, so uh, it's it's a bit of a dramatic way to say something, but um, I I think there is there is something to saying that um, the especially the old medium of a printed book or even a an ebook is something where uh, we talked about this on the new books call. A, a popular book has you know got five thousand or ten thousand readers. A popular tweet has got a million readers. Right? There's a there's a difference there. Um, and so I'm not saying that we shouldn't. Those of us who love books shouldn't stop reading books or creating books. But I am saying that. Um, uh, if you want to have your ideas be part of the conversation, they need to uh, they need to have smaller pieces, and those pieces need to kind of flutter around the internet in lots of different ways. So that's that's what I think about books. Um, and it strikes me <clears throat> it strikes me we might want to have a call about this that particular topic some other time when we're not on this thread, but uh, I I. I care a lot about how ideas propagate and how ideas have sex and how we apply ideas into the world and and use all that information. And I'm being intentionally provocative when I say that books are uh, where information goes to die. But uh, Mr. Jones, the floor is yours. I want to question whether uh, th the thing I love about the check-in calls is that you're paying attention to that person in that moment. And if you wanted to do a sum of it, then you're thinking about how it's fashioned in the future and you're changing the time signature in something that is really nice and random. And you can pay attention to, you know, Stacy when she talks about that. And then I talked about somebody else and they're talking about something else to, to put it into having a note afterward turns it into a future post and it becomes in, in a sense productized 
And then it's also evaluated and tested in a poll. And all those same things seem a really bad, seem to be a commodification of serendipity that the group calls have. So I'm, I'm, I'm a vote for no further productization of the moment that is the check-in. And that's just my view. So that means I should call off my conference call with Nielsen, where I was going to give everybody on the call a people meter so that you could turn your emotion meter up and down as your as the call progresses. And I was going to like sell that data to them, damn it. Yeah, it's, you know, if, if you can do an electric shock when they do what you want them to do, maybe that's a way to do it. I, don't know. I had not thought of that angle, Kevin. That's really clever. Yeah. I like well, that. Well, you know, m most Zoom calls I'm on, I want to get something done or learn from somebody. This is not that. This this is this other thing. All right. So sorry, Nielsen. Off off with that. Uh, Gil, then Patty. Uh, you're still muted. However, it's a newbie mistake. I understand. Oh, I'm well. I'm 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 fresh in every moment, Jerry. Yeah, reborn, <laughs> reborn every second. Yeah, there you go. So, um, uh, many many fingers waving for what Kevin said. Um, completely. Um, um. So I I find myself provoked by this books books are where information goes to die conversation for multiple reasons. One is that books aren't dead. Second is that books aren't about information. Um, third about, um, I, you know, in, in the before times, I, there were bookstores that had book readings. Uh, in fact, some of them had, you know, like two readings a day all the time throughout the year and people would come together. They're back at Powell's. Powell's, you know, Cody's, uh, Books Inc., da, da, da. Um, the experience of going into, into a bookstore like a Cody's when it existed versus going to a Barnes and Noble is utterly, utterly different because you have a store where people actually love books and love to read and know what's in the store and can talk with you. you go in and ask for a book and they say, it's like pre-Amazon here, here's the book, but you might also be interested in X, Y, Z. And a conversation happens. And what if books are about conversations, not information? What if books are a conversation with the author and maybe with other people who've read it? Um, you know, I open a book and I read some and that said, that reminds me of something. I go find another book or I go online and watch a movie or, you know, it's like in and out um, as opposed to a data download. And um, just to note on a couple of things that have been talked about on these calls, uh, Ministry for the Future and the Dawn of Everything are not dead. And they're not tweets. And tweets are great, and Amazon has been very helpful to me. And I do Kindle, and I highlight notes, and the notes get fed back to me periodically. And so there's a, like there's meta levels of stuff, but um, yeah, I'm not concerned about information going to die. That seems the least of our problems right now. Um, Pete, to what you said about um, about IPitis, um, if somebody spends three years writing a book, um, it would be nice if they got some money in return for that. Um, otherwise, in this particular property case, is the wrong way, though, you know, they might not be able to do it. Huh? <laughs> property is the wrong way, though. Property may be the wrong way and copyrights all kinds of problematic. Um, and um, but I, I noticed for myself that my attitude about IP um, shifted as I shifted from being a consumer to a producer. So. But that's 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 a whole other rich topic we can play with at another time. That might be a multi-call sequence too. Um, I mean, you know, we all know what Proudhon said about property. Can anybody else say what Proudhon said about property? Property is theft, is what Proudhon said about pop property. Oh, there you go. You know, early early nineteenth century socialist remarks. Here is Joseph Proudhon. <clears throat> um, Patty, please. Um, really enjoying this conversation about books and uh, the flow of information, how information thrives and uh, reproduces and moves and supports us in evolving. So I, I, I'm i inclined to think that so if, if what humans, I, I guess I kind of believe that what humans create has has life, right? And I, I would imagine that most of us here in this space have had an experience of um, coming into contact with a book in a super serendipitous and kind of like weird magical way at a really um, opportune or unlikely time. I, I do think that there's a flow and a 
drive to how creativity moves um, on the planet and that it, it is a, a bit of a fundamental um, evolutionary power, I guess. And so I, I'm, if, if what humans create has life and if, you know, if, if we want to play with that, if books have life, I am compelled by the idea that they, the information moves and might be subject to the same force that moves other life on this planet, the same evolutionary force. This is a bit of a, a wormhole in the rabbit hole, but I also can agree with Pete in that, um, uh, and that, you know, I, I've, I've had the same feeling where I've gone to bookstores and I feel overwhelmed and hopeless and sad at, you know, all of this, you know, incredible, beautiful work that so many people have worked so hard to create and that will, you know, probably it might well gather dust. And, uh, so I've, I've also experienced that in, um, I don't know, in the experience of, of my relationship with books and reading, but I guess I'm curious if, if what humans, if we want to play around with the idea that what humans create has some kind of life of its own, I would suggest that this conversation itself is is an expression of life moving in its own way. And the question I would ask is how can we, do we want to, and if so, how can we create continuity between conversations? How can we, uh, maybe even between discussions, have some kind of, um, it could be like thought homework, it could be exercises, you know, that we are encouraged to think about and ideas we're encouraged to play with in the week intervening between uh, meetings, but how can we, um, play with the idea that this conversation might be a living thing and how can we facilitate the growth of these conversations in a way that might be a little different than how we're used to quantifying results. I love what you're saying, Patty. I'm totally on board. Um, Judy, then Mike, and then we're getting close to the end of our call. Well, I'll try to be succinct. <clears throat> I really like the calls as they now exist. And so I, I have a slight sense of resisting to trying to change them into something else because we do a combination of deep diving on a topic and we at the same time get the diversity of viewpoints of all of the people in the room on whatever it is that we're talking about. So they're very um, intuitive and momentous in a sense because they're happening in the moment. And so I, I'm, I'm liking the way the calls go at this point. I'm not so much looking for another study group, but I appreciate the wisdom that people share because then if there's a topic I want to dig into, I go get that book and I read it. So I personally feel that we've found a pretty good balance here and I would caution us not to improve us to a lesser level of performance. Well put. Um, partly we landed on Gaza because Stacy challenged us and said, why are we talking about music when there's this really important thing going on? We could really use some focus. And then also uh, Doug Carmichael has frequently said, hey, there's all these great minds together here. Why are we like not lifting the world a little bit more than we could? And he's been challenging us very frequently on that. And I think appropriately so. And so I'm torn between my love of the random walk theory of conversation where we share resources and, and show up as, as kindred spirits, which I adore, and the desire to actually focus, lift, pull, help lift others, you know, leave behind something the way Patty just described, et cetera. And I think this is not a, an a, a unresolvable dilemma. I think this is a polarity to manage. And polarity management basically says, hey, use a little like infinity symbol and just go back and forth and and be explicit about when you're over here and be explicit about when you're over here and that those are two different parts of the rhythm. And then the people who like this will be like, oh, okay, we're coming back to that, et cetera, et cetera. So I, th I think that we can work it in a way. And, and maybe that's, that's partly why we were alternating between topics and check-ins is that the check-in was this random walk feeling of community where, and it was becoming more and more like quicker meeting, um, which gave us sort of a, a piece of a, of a different kind of dynamic in the group. So I'm, I'm, I'm absorbing and thinking about that as we, as we move forward. Thank you. Uh, Mike. Um, I want to build on what Judith just said. I, I do think a number of things work really well with this group. Uh, the most important, I think, are the check-ins as opposed to the deep dives. Um, I think the emotional support we give each other, I think the solution, I mean, often solutions that we sometimes get to for people's personal challenges can be quite interesting. I mean, a three-minute conversation can lead somebody to a 
a resource that they might not have found and help them deal with one of their kids or some personal relationship. Um, I, I personally have found it very helpful to just enunciate some of the things I'm feeling, whether it's the overflow of news or the the, the challenges of juggling my parents. The one thing that I, I'd like to do a little bit more in the check-in is to welcome people requesting help. Um, I mean, I sometimes do that. I take advantage of this group to say, hey, I'm working on a paper. I know three of you probably have an answer to this question. Can you put it in the chat? Or if anybody has an idea, let me know. Um, Adam Grant has this wonderful book, Give and Take. And so much, many of us have a hard time asking but um, and taking advice. And I think we could nurture that in the uh, in, in actually both of the calls. Uh, but I'd, I'd, I'd uh, caution against going into topics three, four, five sessions in a row. Or I mean, I, I think there are different strengths in this group, and somebody who might not be good on one topic might get bored after four days of the same topic. Um, and I and I think there is a point of diminishing returns. I think the most important thing I get out of this is the 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 living bibliography. I mean, finding the right part of Jerry's brain, but also just hearing from everybody else what uh, they found helpful. And sometimes it's a 25-year-old book I never heard of. I would put two two issues on the table, though. I, I do think we could have a very good conversation about redesigning copyright. It's one of my passionate topics. And then there's the question of, you know, how do we do what Jerry has done so well? We've had a number of talks on how do you curate all the knowledge you've accumulated I was having a great talk with my librarian at Carnegie yesterday about Zotero and how there isn't, you know, we don't have a good way to build our personal bibliography that not only works for us, but collects data that we can share with others. I've talked too long, but uh, thanks. I'm sorry I joined late. I was listening to an absolutely mind-blowing conference from Vienna called Can Machines Save the World? And I will send around uh, the two sessions that you gotta gotta listen to. One of them was on the history of AI, and it was probably the most useful thing I've heard about AI. The most useful thirty minutes I've heard since the whole Chat GPT explosion and all these so-called experts talking about things they don't know. Love that, Mike. Thank you. Um, thanks for that, uh, Judy. And then I'm hoping Ken might have a poem for us. And uh, I know okay. that. My hand people. was up for before. Oh, okay. So, so guess what, Ken? I do. Going back to Bill Stafford here. This one's called Learning. A piccolo played, then a drum. Feet began to, began to come, a part of music. Here came a horse, clippity clop away. My mother said, don't run. The army is after someone other than us. If you stay you'll learn our enemy. Then he came, the speaker. He stood in the square. He told us who to hate. I watched my mother's face. It's quiet. That's him, she said. Wow. Oh, read again. Yeah, would you please? Learning. A piccolo played, then a drum. Feet began to feet began to come a part of the music. Here came a horse, clippity clop away. My mother said, "Don't run. The army is after someone other than us. If you stay, you'll learn our enemy." Then he came, the speaker. He stood in the square. He told us who to hate. I watched my mother's face. It's quiet. That's him, she said. That's brilliant. Stafford is a very brilliant poet. Yes. Who, who was the Who was the poet? William, William Stafford. William Stafford. Okay, thanks. I, I posted a link to the poem in the chat. Ben, um, I'm curious, why did that poem, if you know, why did that poem arise for you in this moment? Because uh, we're well, talking so much about learning. 
-hmm. and um and especially about what's been going on in uh israel and gaza you know and for me any years and years ago i read a, a, a quote somewhere that war is a failure of leadership at the highest levels and that there are no warlike people but there are warlike leaders and those who tell you who to hate if you follow them that's the real enemy so i just thought that was a really potent you know way to say it. say it very elegantly you know in a way that i couldn't thank you love that um ken thank you very much that was a beautiful way to wrap our call thanks everybody uh all talk on the mattermost uh, town hall channel ogm town hall or on the ogm list about what to do uh, about format and sequence I'm happy to experiment. I'm happy to try something intense for a little bit and see where it gets us. Uh, and I'm happy also to go back to our normal casual flow. So um, as yeah. Ross Perot so famously said a couple of election cycles ago, I'm all ears. I'm just curious, Kevin, are you saying Jerry's head is full of holes? He is. I well, think you know, a colander. <laughs> yeah. If, if you look at the brain, that's, you know, it, it, it strains through it, it's it is a strainer so yeah obviously okay thank you <laughs> yeah. there we are could somebody throw i think it's more like a gold filter it, get, it gets the one percent that you oh, want to yeah. leave behind colanders you know it's that's more like 95 percent, and we don't have time for 95 percent. it could be sure well curation is a I'm metaphor oh. fail <laughs> Truer Jerry, words were never spoken. All generalizations are false. Jerry, could you throw the Mattermost link in the chat? And if someone would care to, what's the difference between the Mattermost chat and the Open Global Mind? Okay, so Open Global Mind is, is a Google group uh, mailing list. Hold on one second while I get the Town Square link and paste it so I don't forget that. Uh, so the OGM list is a is a... <laughs> A Google group where there is an archive, but I don't I don't know anybody who goes and looks at the archive of mailing lists very often. And so the conversation is pretty transient there, and it's about whatever. That's where I announce the OGM calls and, and a couple other things. Uh, and that's where Ken and a few other people post, and you, Gil, often post, hey, here's a really interesting article. Here's why you should go read it or a video or whatever. Um, the Mattermost is a persistent conversation with channels around different topics and themes. So there's a whole bunch of projects that are going on here, like Neobooks has a channel on Mattermost. And uh, the Neobooks crew doesn't like chat about ne Neobooks on the OGM list. We go to the Mattermost channel and talk back and forth and share uh, resources. So you can, it, what's cool about Mattermost, which is an open source Slack clone, uh, is that you can scroll back and see all the things that have happened and go back and forth and and you can add a channel if you if you have a project of your own that you'd like uh, to to have a conversation around you can create one there uh, so I I really like the matter most um, so, I find should that we, should we deprecate the Google list uh, we've uh, Pete and I have had Any this conversation value? multiple times Pete is not that fond of the OGM list but I think that things that show up in people's email are actually pretty important um, it, and so I. Mattermost doesn't push. Uh, if you have, if you're, if you're signal out, uh, for instance, if I were to say at Gill on Mattermost and you had an account on the Mattermost channel, you would get an email that says, hey, somebody's, somebody's pinging you directly on Mattermost. Otherwise, no. Otherwise, you'd be overwhelmed by email if every time something showed up on Mattermost, you were getting an email as well. Um, there may be a setting in Mattermost where you can have it send you everything, but I would never turn that on. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Cool. Um, thanks, everybody. That was um, delicious. Mm -hmm. Really appreciate it. Mm -hmm. More soon. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. Ciao.